Tonight we're continuing our series on a closer look at 12 Ordinary Men. And the thing that to me has been most interesting about this particular subject is we can look at these 12 Ordinary Men and look at them in juxtaposition to our own lives and see how some of the things that they may have done or not done, how it affects us and what we do and, and so forth. So I think that that's a very good thing. Now the last time we were together, we ended up talking about the third phase of the Twelves Calling because we talked about how you can be called to something and it, you may arrive at that destination through phases. It doesn't just automatically happen as an instant uh, thing. You know, when you think about it, when you think about a couple who's having a baby, they're all excited because they know they're gonna have a baby and you know, nine months later the baby should be born, all things being equal. But there's a whole lot that goes on in that period of time. And the mothers can truly have stories to tell about all that goes on before that precious little bundle of joy arrives. Well, when you are called to a position, many times there are phases and a lot of things that go on before you actually reach the maturity of what it is that you've been called to do. So we were talking and we spent quite a bit of time on the third phase of the Twelves Calling. Do you remember what the third phase is? Oh, you're so good, yes. That's when they were called to apostleship. That was the third phase. So what were the first two? The first one was calling, which was conversion. The second one was what? Call to ministry. And the third one, apostleship. Good, see, you all get an A. <laughs> that's excellent. Um, and that's wonderful. We can imagine because we really, actually, I'll just take you back to it. Go to Mark's Gospel, the sixth chapter, and we're going to look at verses seven through nine. And I'm going to share it with you out of the Amplified. Mark's Gospel, the sixth chapter, verses seven through nine. Starting with verse seven, it says, And he, meaning Jesus, called the twelve disciples and began to send them out as his special messengers, two by two, and gave them authority and power over the unclean spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a mere walking stick, no bread, no traveler's bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals. And he told them not to wear two tunics. Now we talked last time and explained how it was tradition during that time frame when people traveled that they would wear like two tunics or two sets of clothes when you think about it. So that, because think about how they traveled. You know, they traveled, they had on sandals, they were dirt roads, there was no paving. So everything got dusty. That's how come when they entered into different places, they would have somebody there to actually rinse their feet or wash their feet of the dust because that's they got grungy, for lack of a better term, as they traveled. So this way, if they had two tunics on or two outfits, they could take off the dusty one, take care of that, and at least have a clean one on, you know, aside from that. In this particular instance, Jesus is telling them he doesn't want them even being concerned with that. Just go as you are, wear sandals. Obviously, they got to do that and they didn't have to go with bare feet. He didn't even want them taking what? A traveler's bag. In other words, we all know it's better to leave home with some money in your pocket than with none. He's telling them, don't even be concerned with that. Just go. Just be obedient. Just listen to me. That is literally what he is instructing them to do. And we talked about how for many of us, that would even be like pushing it to think that we would leave our place of wherever we live and just walk out and we're just trusting God. We don't have any extra money. We don't have anything but whatever we've got on our physical bodies and we're just going to trust and do whatever it is he tells us to do and where he instructs us to go. He doesn't even put us through that. And we still have a hard time listening. Can you imagine what they went through? Because they literally were trusting everything that came out of his mouth because he wasn't giving them any fallback plan, nothing to fall back on, but rather just trusting in him. I thought that was very interesting. So you can imagine what they must have felt like. Now, you may ask, and I asked this question last week, why am I spending so much time on calling? 
Like, what's the big deal? You just want to kind of, maybe some of you just want to get into the 12 disciples and start naming off each one and what did they do and blah, blah, blah. The reason why I'm doing that is because everything that is written in scripture, it is really a love letter to us as believers. It's there for a reason. It is not there just for us to see that, you know, Peter may have liked chocolate. Now, I don't know if Peter liked chocolate, but I'm just saying. I mean, I know I do. But you know, that's not the thing. It's everything that's there, every single word, it's there for us to glean something from, for us to learn from, so that we can become even stronger and better in our journey. So we need to understand what was the importance of their calling, what was the big deal, because all of us, as I said to you last week, all of us are called to something. And Many of you already may know what your calling is, and I'm very, pr I praise God with you if you know what your calling is. But I know for a fact that some of you may not know, and that's okay that you may not know. You will look back on it later on, and you will find that God is still working it all through you and bringing you to the next phase. It's okay if you don't know exactly what it is yet. But the point is you need to understand that you are called. It's not like you were just born to go to the job that you have now, and you're just supposed to work on that job and come home and have your whatever you fix for yourself to eat and get up in the morning and do the same thing, come out on Thursday to Bible study, and if we have an event, praise the Lord, and then on Sunday you come to church and you just do this over and over. You're not a hamster that's on a wheel that's just doing the same thing over and over. But if you listen to society and if you look at just what your need may be, because obviously we go to work not just because we love to go to work, okay, we'd much rather be on a cruise or somewhere, but we go there so that we can get money to be able to take care of our needs because if man doesn't work, what happens? He doesn't eat. We get that. But we have to realize that we are called as children of God. We are joint heirs with God and with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's a whole lot more than just doing the same repeated thing over and over and over. The world is not going to tell you that. They're not going to remind you of that. That's what we have to do. We have to remind ourselves of whose we are and the fact that, wow, there's something unique that I'm supposed to do that nobody else in this earth realm was called to do, just me. And find out what that thing is, and then we can get about doing it because then we're doing what the Lord has called us to do. Now, we had learned, and this is where we left off, and I will go over it because I think it's worth reiterating. Um, Minister Scott, in his teaching, he explained to us that there are different callings, okay? And um, he explained that first and foremost, and as I had even said last week, this is the best, is when God calls a person. If God calls you to something, then it's up to God to provide what it is he's called you to do, to provide for it. In other words, God gave the Apostle Price a vision many, many years ago. And when he gave him that vision, it became God's responsibility to nurture that vision and to also provide him with whatever it was that he needed to allow that vision to manifest itself. Okay, we can all agree with that, right? We're all sitting here as a result of that. We also talked about, as Minister Scott suggested, that sometimes a church, a particular church, may call a person to be their pastor. Okay, I mean, that happens. We're aware of that. We know that. Um, now, if a particular church calls a person to be the pastor, then the responsibility of that particular pastor is now upon the church because the church called them. So the church is responsible for taking care of them and providing for them and so forth and so on. Then a very interesting thing is people can call themselves to a position. There are some people who call themselves to be pastors or call themselves to be deacons or call themselves to be whatever. Okay, whatever you can think of, that's what they call themselves to be. Here's the thing, if they call themselves to be it, then isn't that the same as self-appointment? They self-appointed themselves to that position. So if they self-appoint themselves to that position, then they now are responsible for the provision and everything else regarding that. And that's where we gotta be very careful. Because if you are calling yourself to a particular position, then you need to be the one that's going to take care of everything regarding that. And you may find out that since your wisdom is finite and it's not infinite as God's is, you may miss something. Just like there are churches who will call pastors who have missed it. 
missed it in the sense that their intention was right. They thought it was the right person, but see, God knew something a little bit different that they didn't pick up on and it wasn't the right fit. Hmm, we can maybe know a little bit of that about that too. The point being is the best calling is the calling from God because then you know you are in your rightful place and you're doing what it is that you need to do. And I did spend time and I've been asking you to please think and spend some time yourself with God to find out what is your calling? What are you supposed to be doing? And you know, it was something, I was having a conversation earlier this morning with Stan and uh, we think about, when we talk about the trickle down effect, we automatically, because you hear that, it's a dog whistle or a sound bite that you hear the pundits talk about all the time. And usually they're talking about the 1% who you know, have all this money and it's gonna trickle on down and you know, then perhaps maybe we'll get some of it. You know, that's when we hear of trickle down, we usually start thinking of finances. But I like to think of that phrase, we can also use that when it comes to our own spiritual walk. And you've gotta be very careful because when you think back, when we really think back, even when we go to all those sight and sound productions and they're usually showing us something or portraying something that happened in the Old Testament and we hear about Daniel and you know, or if you read the scripture, if you've never even gone to sight and sound, you read the scriptures and you talk about or read about Nehemiah and you read about all of these great men and women of God, the different things that they did, Ruth, all of them, where was their focus? Their focus was 100% on God. That's it. I mean, you know, when you think about the three Hebrew boys, when they got cast into the fire, why weren't they afraid? They weren't afraid because their focus was 100%. It was like they had blinders on. Okay, that was all of those thousands of years ago. Here we are in 2018. What is our position? Are the blinders on like that? Now you could sit up and tell me that they are, they're not, <laughs> okay? Because of this world in which we live and all of the things that we are, yes, still growing, and that's a good thing, so I'm not beating up on any of us, praise the Lord. We're here on Thursday night, so obviously we're trying. But what I'm saying to you is, we don't have those blinders totally on. We have things that are distracting us going from one place to the next place to the next place. And you have to understand that you've gotta take some time, you've gotta figure it out. I don't care if it means you give up an hour sleep, okay? I mean, so what? Figure something out where you're reining that time in, where you can just sit and be able to hear directly from God and find out what it is that he needs you to do, that he wants you to do, so that you can go forward and do it. I promise you, it will be worth that time that you take. Figure out how to do it, but it's something that we're getting ready to get into a whole nother year of 2019 and God has been so gracious and he has brought us through 2018. We might have gotten, had some little stumbles along the way and it might not have been easy, but we're still here. We need to make sure and purpose in our hearts that we really kind of rein in and start focusing more on him in 2019. And don't just look for what's in his hand to give you, but seek his face and find out what it is that he wants from you. Now, that wasn't in this at all, but anyway, <laughs> it must have been something that we needed to hear. During the time that these precious men, and I had already shared with you, so I'm not even gonna go back into it, about how I, as far as I'm concerned, God showed me what I was supposed to do at 28 years old, okay? I was 28, wow, those were good years. Anyway, <laughs> I was 28. It wasn't until 50. Now, do the math, that's a long time from 28 to 50, but that's why I guess for me, I can totally appreciate what I'm sharing with you about phases of calling. He was clear what I was supposed to do when I was 28. Why did it take me until 50 to finally figure it out? Well, I know why, because he showed me, and that's the other thing, he will show you different things. I wasn't, I still had me in the way. And I was looking at all of my inadequacies and all the things wrong with me and all the reasons why I couldn't possibly do what he was suggesting. I couldn't possibly wrap my head around it. I got in the way of it because it's never about you. It's always about him. And I had to see that for myself. So learn from my experience. Don't be hard-headed or whatever you want to call it. 
dim witted, however you want to put it, don't do what I did. Don't waste that amount of time. Even though he was perfecting some things during that time period, but it took a little while for it to manifest. The great news in it all was I never gave up. I still was listening. So that's what I just want all of us to continue to do. Keep listening because none of us are perfect. But guess what? God does not expect perfection, but he appreciates progress. So that's something that we have to continue to do. And I know that we're going to do it. Now, back to these 12 ordinary men. During their training, Jesus was always very close by, okay? He was very close by and he was nurturing them along the way, literally, almost like a good parent would do to their children. They would always check back with him, providing updates on how things were progressing. Why? Because again, he appreciates progress. After doing this for a little while though, they returned to the Lord and remained with him for, ex for an extended time of teaching, ministry, fellowship, and rest. That's something that's also we're not encouraged to do in this world in which we live. It's like, oh, if you tell somebody that you only slept for an hour and a half, that's like, oh, that's wonderful. No, that's terrible. You should be able to sleep seven to eight hours a night, at least six hours. If you're not, you need to figure out what it is that you need to do because guess what? You need to rest. If Jesus rested, are you better than the Lord? No. So that means you've got to get rest. You've got to figure out what you must do to get that rest because your body will function to the perfection that God created it to function when you give it what it needs. And one of the things it needs is rest. So you have to be able, now see you know that this is the Holy Spirit because this is something that I'm constantly, progressively working on because I am one of those people who don't necessarily get as much rest as I should. So that lets you know he's definitely speaking through me and I'm learning, gotta get more rest, okay? But we really do have to do that. So let's look to, um, let's look in Luke. Luke's Gospel, the ninth chapter. And we're gonna look at verses 10 and 11. Luke 9, Luke 9, no, can you hold your question until the end? I appreciate that. Luke 9, and we're going to look at verses 10 and 11. I'm going to share it with you first out of the Amplified. The Amplified Bible says, When the apostles returned, they told him, meaning Jesus, all that they had done. He took them with him, and he privately withdrew across the Jordan to a city called Bethsaida. But when the crowds learned of it, they followed him. And he welcomed them and he began talking to them about the kingdom of God and healing and those who needed to be healed. If we look at it in the Message Bible, it says the apostles returned and reported on what they had done. Jesus took them away off by themselves near the town called Bethsaida. But the crowds got wind of it and followed. Jesus graciously welcomed them and talked to them about the kingdom of God. Those who needed healing, he healed. Now you're in Luke, go to, just go right on over to the 10th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 17. Luke 10, verse 17. Out of the Amplified it says, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And the message says, the 70 came back triumphant, master, even the demons dance to your tune. Now let's look at... Mark's gospel. See, they even, I think, you know, I imagine them during that time, they were really excited themselves to see that what they were being taught was actually manifesting in their lives. We don't ever want to get to a point where we become desensitized. You know, like how when we have, um, like say for instance, if we have a Sunday morning worship service and we offer people to come up to receive their healing and then nobody comes up that's not a time where we like okay nobody comes up let's just go to the next thing no we've got to be excited about that we can't become desensitized to the point where we don't recognize that people are walking in divine health or they are exercising their faith with confidence that they are healed and they don't need that that is something to get excited about but we can sometimes just like okay and we're just on to the next thing 
Don't allow that to happen to yourself. Don't become desensitized. And in this world, it can easily be done because you turn on the TV, today, I don't know how many people got shot, okay? You look three or four days later, somebody else got shot. Pretty soon, you turn it on and it's almost like somebody saying, hi, how are you? You don't even recognize the gravity of what's happening. We are the salt of the earth. The world can be that way if they want. I call them like they're almost in a coma. They're just going through life not knowing what's going on. We can't be that way because we are the what? Carriers of light. Jesus is within us. They have to see a difference in us. And we can't become desensitized or then we just morph right on into you know, doing the same things that they do. That's why it tells us in Romans what? That we have to constantly do what? We have to renew our mind. We've got to stay in the word. Figure out a way to do it. You've got to. Because if you don't, yes, you'll be born again. You'll be spirit filled. Yes, you will go to heaven. Praise the Lord. But your life, you'll be on that hamster's wheel where you're just doing the same thing over and over and over. And that's not at all what God intended for you at all. Turn with me to Mark's Gospel, and we're going to look at chapter 6, verses 30 through 34. Mark 6, starting at verse 30, and I'm going to share it with you out of the Amplified. And this, just to set it up, is when the 5,000 people were fed. Okay, we all pretty much have learned that story from when we were children. Um, so starting with verse 30, it says, The apostles who had been sent out on a mission gathered together with Jesus and told him everything that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a little while. Now notice, after they ministered, they did what? They needed to rest. For there were many people who were continually coming and going, and they could not even find time to eat. And they went away by themselves in the boat to a secluded place. Many people saw them leaving and recognized them and ran together on foot from all the surrounding cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd waiting and he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, lacking guidance. And he began to teach them many things. Now, if we look at this in the message, it says it a little different. It says, the apostles then rendezvoused with Jesus and reported on all they had done and taught. Jesus said, come away by yourselves. Let's take a break and get a little rest. For there was a constant coming and going. They didn't even have time to eat. So they got in the boat and went off to a remote place by themselves. Someone saw them going and the word got around. From the surrounding towns, people went out on foot running and got there ahead of them. When Jesus arrived, he saw this huge crowd. At the sight of them, his heart broke. Like sheep with no shepherd they were. He went right to work teaching them. In other words, you could see some of us <laughs> might look at it like, oh my goodness, we were trying to get away and get a break and here are all these people, what are we supposed to do? That, again, that might be the response, right? No, what did he do? He was filled with compassion. He just wanted to, again, be of service to them. Now, the fourth phase because now we're entering into the fourth phase of the calling of these 12 ordinary men, occurred after the resurrection of Jesus. Judas Iscariot was missing from the group because we already know he went and hung himself due to his portrayal of Christ, betrayal rather, of Christ. Jesus appeared to the remaining 11 in his resurrection body and commanded them to disciple the nations. This is, in effect, a call to martyrdom. Now, martyrdom is not a term that we use often. The dictionary defines the term as a noun to mean, one, the condition, sufferings, or death of a martyr. Two, extreme suffering or torment. In other words, these 12 ordinary men were first called to conversion, then to ministry, then to apostleship, and then to martyrdom. And that's something when you think about it. Think about, again, that trickle-down effect that I talked about. Think about the fact that you will hear Minister Scott get up and say how the sheep need to bring people into church for them to be fed. 
Or think about how I may say to you, remember the fact that somebody thought to share the good news of Jesus with you and you might want to return that favor and share it with someone else. We hear that, we know that, but if we're authentic with ourselves, we're desensitized to it because we'll leave and for about 10 or 15 minutes, we'll think about that and go, yeah, you know, I really should do that. I really should call up so-and-so or maybe I'll see somebody, you know, I'll invite them, yeah. 10 or 15 minutes, that's about it. Because as soon as we hit the road or hit out to get on the train or the bus or wherever you're gonna go, that thought just goes just that fast, which is what the enemy gets so excited about. He's thrilled that that goes that fast. He is so happy that that goes that fast. But here is the point. <laughs> These 12 ordinary men, these chosen men ultimately gave their lives for the sake of the gospel. You're not being asked to give your life. Nobody is trying to kill you for spreading the good news of Jesus. All you have to merely do is invite them. But you see, if I said to you here, I have free AMC tickets for you to go see Creed II and see Michael B. Jordan, or you can go and see whatever other movie is out, oh, you'll jump to that, and you'll find somebody to take with you to use the other ticket. But yet and still, to tell them anything about Jesus, which could change their life, and not just their life, but generations of their family to come, um, no, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. Well, praise God that these 12 ordinary men did not have that mentality, because they literally gave their lives to make sure that this gospel that we are able to have be a part of our lives, that has changed our lives, they didn't have that, that attitude and they gave their lives for it. History actually records that all but one of them were killed for their testimony. Only John is said to have lived to old age and he was actually severely persecuted for Christ's sake. Then he was exiled to the tiny island of Patmos. No matter what these 12 ordinary men endured, they grew through it and triumphed. The important thing is that despite great persecution and even martyrdom and giving up their lives, they completed their task. They never, ever gave up. Now let's take a little bit more time and concentrate just on phase three of their calling, and that is their selection and appointment to apostleship. Please pay attention to the details as stated in Luke's gospel, because you will see, and you may have already noticed, as you're studying the different gospels, they may be giving you the same account, but differently. You know, like somebody can give you an account of how uh, the event was on November 30th, and they may give you a gloss over and they may just tell you how, oh, it was just a wonderful event, it was great. And you know, you may ask somebody else and they'll tell you how, oh yes, we had people get up and we danced to every praise and we just had a wonderful time. Then you may have somebody else talk about the food. Then you may have somebody get up and tell you every single detail. They'll tell you everything that's on the menu, tell you about the dance floor, tell you about the lights on the dance floor and can tell you every detail all the same account of that event, but it's just a matter in who is telling the story. Well, it's the same thing with the Gospels. When you really sit and study them, you will find out that these particular people who wrote them, they had a different way of explaining it. So I want us to pay attention to Luke in this particular instance. Turn with me to Luke's Gospel, the sixth chapter. And we're gonna look at verse 12. This is Luke 6, verse 12. And it says, starting with the Amplified, that's the first one I'm going to share it with. It says, now at this time, Jesus went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. If we look at it in the Message Bible, it says, at about the same time, he climbed a mountain to pray. He was there all night in prayer before God. The next day, he summoned his disciples, and from them, he selected those, of course, the apostles that he wanted. If we look at it in the American Standard Version, which is not one I usually use, it says, and it came to pass in these days that he went out into the mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer. Now notice, the Amplified says, now at this time. The message says, about that same time. And the American Standard says, and it came 
to pass in these days. All of them make it sound like they're talking about time, correct? A specific amount of time. Well, here's the thing. Luke is not referring to time indicated on a clock or the specific days of the month. That's not what he's talking about. Rather, he is referring to a period of time, a season, a distinct phase in the ministry of Jesus, which is distinctly different. It was an interval in his ministry when the opposition to him peaked. Because again, that's not something we spend a lot of time thinking about. We just think about, oh, he's our savior, Jesus, and he's so wonderful. And, you know, droves of people were just coming to hear him teach and, you know, uh, heal them. And, and we just kind of think along those terms. We don't necessarily think of what he had to go through. It, everybody didn't just receive him and think he was wonderful. He had to actually endure quite a lot of persecution. So that's what this time in, in Luke's Gospel 6 and the 12th verse, that's what they're talking about, the period of time. And it was when the opposition to Jesus actually peaked. Luke's Gospel records the vicious opposition that Christ was beginning to receive from whom? From the scribes and the Pharisees. Turn with me, you're already in Luke, go to the fifth chapter, and we're gonna look at verse 17. And if we look at it in the New King James Version, it says, Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. If we look at it in the Message Bible, it says, One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and religion teachers were sitting around. They had come from nearly every village in Galilee and Judea, even as far away as Jerusalem, to be there. The healing power of God was on them. Now, this is the first mention. This is Luke's first mention of the Pharisees, okay? Now, if you drop down, you're already in chapter 5. Let's just look at the 21st verse. If we look at it in the New King James Version, it says, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this? Who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And if you look at it in the message, it says, That set the religion, scholars, and Pharisees buzzing. Who does he think he is? That's blasphemous talk. God and only God can forgive sins. Now, if you look at it in the 21st verse, as we just did, this is Luke's first use of the scribes, although the scribes are mentioned alongside the Pharisees as teachers of the law in verse 17. We are first introduced to Jesus' chief adversaries in that 17th verse of Luke 5, and Luke's account of their opposition is, thrown, so, is shown rather throughout the whole chapter of 5 and well into 6. So when you get a chance, read that. Because if you read all of chapter 5 and the beginning of 6, you will see just how much he had to go through. Now, Luke does a great job of describing the escalating conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders of Judaism. They opposed him when he healed the paralytic and forgave his sins. They thought that was just horrible. If you go back to, we're going to pick up on the 17th verse of Luke 5. So go back to Luke 5, and we're going to look at verses 17 through 26. Now you can jot this down, or you can just relax and listen to me read it, because it's a lot. <laughs> I'm going to share it with you first out of the Amplified, and it says, One day as he was teaching, meaning Jesus, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law, who are the scribes, sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present with him to heal. Some men came carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed, and they tried to bring him in and lay him down in front of Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and removed some tiles to make an opening and lowered him through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their active faith springing from confidence in him, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. The scribes and the Pharisees began to consider and question the implications, excuse me, of what he had said, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies by claiming the rights and prerogatives of God? Who 
can forgive sins, that is remove guilt, nullify sin's penalty, and assign righteousness except God alone. But Jesus, knowing their hostile thoughts, answered them, why are you questioning these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? But in order that you may know that the Son of Man, the Messiah, has authority and power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. He immediately stood up before them, picked up his stretcher, and went home, glorifying and praising God. They were all astonished, and they began glorifying God, and they were filled with reverential fear and kept saying, we have seen wonderful and incredible things today. Now, just so that you know, the, the roof of a typical home during that time was composed of clay tiles, which were laid on a mat of branches and grass supported them by wooden beams. So when they actually removed those tiles to lower them, they could do it a little bit more easily than we may think, because we're thinking of like cement buildings and all the rest of this. No, not really. It was a little bit easier for them to do. But it was still a tremendous act of their faith in Jesus that they would be willing to do such a thing. If we look at this in the Message Bible, it's a little different. It says, one day as he was teaching Pharisees and religion, T religion teachers were sitting around. They had come from nearly every village in Galilee and Judea and even as far away as Jerusalem to be there. The healing power of God was on him. Some men carrying a paraplegic on a stretcher, they arrived. They were looking for a way to get into the house and they set him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, removed some tiles, and let him down in the middle of everyone right in front of Jesus. Impressed by their bold belief, he said, friend, I forgive your sins. That set the religion scholars and Pharisees buzzing. Who does he think he is that blasphemous talk? God and only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking and said, why all this gossipy whispering? Which is simpler, to say, I forgive your sins, or to say, get up and start walking? Well, just so it's clear that I'm the Son of Man and authorized to do either or both, he now spoke directly to the paraplegic, get up, take your bedroll, and go home. Without a moment's hesitation, he did it. Got up, took his blanket, and left for home, giving glory to God all the way. The people rubbed their eyes, incredulous, and then also gave glory to God. Awestruck, they said, we've seen, we've never seen anything like that, which this is true. Um, now here's another thing. They opposed him for everything. So they, he healed this man. They had a problem with that. They also opposed him for eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. He gives them a great answer, though, for this. You're in Luke. Go drop down to the 27th verse. So this is still Luke 5. You're going to drop down to the 27th verse. And I'm going to share it with you out of the Amplified. And it says, oh, wait a minute, am I or am I not? Oh, wow. Yeah, I guess I will. All right. How did the Amplified, it says, starting with verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi, Matthew, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me as my disciple. Now here's the qualifier. Accepting me as your master and teacher and walking the same path of life that I walk. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow Jesus as his disciple. Levi, Matthew, gave a great banquet for him and his house. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes, seeing those with whom he was associating, began murmuring and discontent to his disciples asking, why are you eating and drinking with the tax collectors and sinners, including non-observant Jews? And Jesus replied to them, is it not those who are healthy who need a physician? But no, it is not, sorry. It is not those, not those who are healthy who need a physician, but only those who are sick. I did not come to call the self-proclaimed, oh, I love this, self-proclaimed righteous, 
who see no need to repent, but sinners to repentance, to change their old way of thinking, to turn from sin, and to seek God and his righteousness. Then they said to him, the disciples of John the Baptist often practice fasting and offer prayers of special petition, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. Jesus said to them, can you make the wedding guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But days for mourning will come when the bridegroom is forcefully taken away from them. They will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old one. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine sacks. Otherwise, the new fermenting wine will expand and burst the skins, and it will be spilled out, and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new, for he says the old is fine. That's a lot. So I'm going to share it with you out of the message because it breaks it down a little bit easier. But I really like it. After this, he went out and saw a man called Levi at his work collecting taxes. Jesus said, come along with me. And he did. Walked away from everything and went with him. Levi gave a large dinner at his house for Jesus. Everybody was there. Taxmen and other disreputable characters as guests at the dinner. The Pharisees and their religion scholars came to his disciples greatly offended. And I'm sure, I'm going to pause here, we know some of our pious brothers and sisters who are Christian who can be greatly offended at the least of things, okay? We want to make sure that we don't become like that because why? The Pharisees were also that way and we do not want to be like the Pharisees, okay? Picking back up with verse 30. What is he doing eating and drinking with crooks and sinners? Jesus heard about it and spoke up. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders, an invitation to a changed life, change inside and out. They asked him, John's disciples are well known for keeping fasts and saying prayers. Now I have to pause here too, because there are a lot of Christians who will sit up and look down their noses at you if you are not fasting. Like, you must go fast, and you must go pray. Where does it say that? But this is what they believe, and if you are not fasting, see, you can live a fasted life. It doesn't mean that you don't eat food, but you live a fasted life in all that you do. But anyway, back to this. I always find this very interesting, because there are a lot of Christians who really, really do believe this. So anyway, they asked him, and they are telling him about John's disciples are well known for keeping fast and saying prayers. Also, the Pharisees, but you seem to spend most of your time at parties. <laughs> Why? Oh, I love it. Jesus said, when you're celebrating a wedding, you don't skimp on the cake and wine. You feast. Later, you may need to pull in your belt, <laughs> but this isn't the time. As long as the bride and groom are with you, you have a good time. When the groom is gone, the fasting can begin. No one throws cold water on a friendly bonfire. This is kingdom come. No one cuts up a fine silk scarf to patch old work clothes. You want fabrics that match. And you don't put wine in old cracked bottles. You get strong, clean bottles for your fresh vintage wine. And no one who's ever tasted fine aged wine prefers unaged wine. And that is 100% true. So the point being is, we need to think about that even in our day-to-day -day lives. Because again, we're studying this because we're putting it in juxtaposition to who we are and how we conduct ourselves. Amen? So look, you're already in Luke. Turn over to the sixth chapter. Just go one chapter over. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And out of the Amplified, starting with verse 1 in chapter 6, it says, One Sabbath, while Jesus was passing through fields of standing grain, it happened that his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating them. But some of the Pharisees, these wonderful Pharisees, said, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? 
Jesus replied to them, have you not even read in the scriptures what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is unlawful, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests alone, and how he also gave it to the men who were with him? Jesus was saying to them, the Son of Man, the Messiah, is Lord even of the Sabbath. Hmm. Again, you can get so caught up in tradition that you are missing the whole entire point of what is being said and done when it comes to your relationship with Christ and the kingdom. Pastor Landry did a great job of talking about that and talking about churchianity and how we don't want to get caught up in all the rest of that kind of stuff. We want a relationship and we have to have a good understanding of it and not getting caught up in a bunch of other stuff. The Message Bible for those same verses of scripture, Luke 6, Verses 1 through 11 says it this way. On a certain Sabbath, Jesus was walking through a field of ripe grain. His disciples were pulling off heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands to get rid of the chaff and eating them. Some Pharisees said, why are you doing that? Breaking a Sabbath rule. But Jesus stood up for them. Have you ever read the David? Have you ever read what David and those with him did when they were hungry? How he entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar, bread that no one but the priests were allowed to eat. He also handed it out to his companions. Then he said, the son of man is no slave to the Sabbath. He's in charge. I thought that was perfect. They complained when his disciples plucked the heads of grain to eat them on the Sabbath. They opposed him for healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath as well. On another, after, actually on another time, Luke recounts the incidents and highlights the growing opposition of the religious leaders. The conflict reaches a high point. In Luke's Gospel, the 6th chapter and the 11th verse, the scribes and Pharisees were actually filled with rage and they discussed with one another what they might do with this man called Jesus. If we check out the accounts of Mark and Matthew, because that's something that you can do too, we find that they are more graphic, okay? They are a lot more graphic. Luke was kind of nice. They're more graphic with the situation. And they report that the religious leaders wanted to actually destroy Jesus. You know, like they wanted to turn it into a Stephen King novel. They really wanted to actually destroy him. And when we come back, we will pick up and we'll start with Matthew's Gospel, the 12th chapter. And we will go into exactly what they wanted to do with him at that point in time. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. 
you can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.